This screencast introduces you to muscles. This topic may be found in Chapter 6 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the functions of muscles. Define extensibility and excitability. Describe the basic anatomy, functions, and locations of the three types of muscle tissue. Describe the gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle. And finally, compare and contrast a tendon with an aponeurosis. I would like to start our discussion on muscles by first discussing the functions of muscles. Muscles move things. They move body parts as well as substances within the body. Skeletal muscles use bones like levers to cause locomotion. Smooth muscles and cardiac muscles move blood, urine, food, and other substances within the body. Another function of muscles is to maintain posture. In order for you to hold your head up, to sit up, or to stand, certain postural muscles are in, con are in a state of continual contraction which allows you to maintain your posture. Muscles also adjust the volumes of various hollow organs. Muscles of the bladder, the stomach, the blood vessels, and other organs adjust the volume holding capacities of these organs. Muscles also reinforce joints, skeletal muscles specifically. Skeletal muscles span joints and help hold the bones of those joints in place. Lastly, a very important function of muscles, skeletal muscles specifically, is the production of heat. Your body is at least 40% skeletal muscle. These skeletal muscles are always in a state of contraction and as they contract, they use energy in the form of ATP. And some of that energy escapes as heat and warms the body. When your body temperature falls, your hypothalamus causes your skeletal muscles to contract more vigorously and you shiver. And this, this process of increased contraction or shivering uses more energy and therefore increases the heat produced by your muscles in an attempt to raise body temperature back to the normal level. All muscles cause movement by contracting or shortening. Think of a contraction with respect to English. Can't is the shortening of cannot. Don't is the shortening of do not. And those are contractions. So, con so when a muscle contracts, it simply shortens. Contraction of a muscle is due to the movement and interactions of these protein-containing structures of the cytoskeleton called myofilaments. You were introduced to these myofilaments when you studied the microfilaments of the cytoskeleton back in the cells and tissues chapter. The term muscle is derived from Latin. The Latin word mus means mouse. Uh, the gentleman who first termed the word muscle thought that a skeletal muscle below the skin sort of looked like a little mouse scurrying below the skin and that's how we arrived at the term muscle. As you study the muscles you will become familiar with the prefixes myo, mice, and sarco. Myo and mice are derived from Greek meaning muscle or mouse. Sarco is Greek for flesh, and when we refer to the flesh of an animal or even the flesh of a human being, for the most part, what we're talking about are the skeletal muscles of those uh, animals. So, as you study the gross and microscopic anatomy of the muscles of the body, you will become familiar with myo, mice, 
in sarco as they are uh, typical prefixes for many anatomical terms. All muscle tissue has a property called extensibility, that is, the capability of being stretched without tearing. The opening and closing of the mouth during chewing or talking, walking, throwing, other body movements require certain muscles to contract while others are relaxing and being stretched. All muscles also have a property called excitability where they can be stimulated to contract. Neurotransmitters and certain drugs can stimulate muscles to contract. And hormones and other drugs can increase or decrease the excitability of a muscle cell or muscle tissue. There are three types of muscle. They differ for the most part in four areas, location, microscopic anatomy, whether or not they are subject to conscious control, and the type of contraction which they produce. Cardiac muscle tissue is only found in the heart. If you look at the tissue under the microscope, you will notice that it has striations or a banding pattern, and this is because of the alignment of the myofilaments. Cardiac muscle cells typically only have one nucleus. However, sometimes they will have two nuclei. The cells are branched and inter connected, and the cells are joined to one another by an intercalated disc. The intercalated disc is a combination of a gap junction and desmosome. Cardiac muscle cells are involuntary. We cannot control them. We can have an impact on their activity through some deliberate activity, such as meditating, or increasing our activity, you know, vigorous exercise. Uh, however, for the most part, they are involuntary and they also have the ability to spontaneously contract. Certain cardiac muscle cells have what's called pacemaker activity. Smooth muscle tissue, in contrast to cardiac muscle tissue, has no striation. If you look under the microscope, they appear to be smooth, and that's where they get their names. The cells of smooth muscles are spindle-shaped, that is, they're fat in the middle and tapered toward the end. Smooth muscles only have one nucleus. Like cardiac muscle tissue, they are not under conscious control. You find smooth muscle in the walls of hollow organs, such as the urinary tract, the digestive tract. They produce very slow, but very long, sustained rhythmic contractions. Skeletal muscle tissue is striated. Like cardiac muscle tissue, when viewed under the microscope, you see the characteristic banding pattern as shown in this slide. And this is due to the arrangement of the micro uh, or myofilaments. Skeletal muscle cells can be up to a foot long, and that is why they are often referred to as muscle fibers. Even though they are very long, they are very thin, and so you still have to view them under the microscope. Skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. They contain many nuclei. Skeletal muscle tissue is the only muscle tissue that is subject to conscious control. Now, that does not mean that they are under total voluntary control, because certainly there is an involuntary aspect to uh, the control of our skeletal muscles. When we shiver, that's not a voluntary uh, act. Also, while we sleep or even when we are unconscious, our diaphragm continues to contract to allow us to breathe. But skeletal muscle tissue is the only tissue, uh, only muscle tissue that is subject to any type of conscious control. When you compare the how quickly skeletal muscles contract and the duration to which they contract, uh, they are they contract more quickly and for a shorter duration compared to 
smooth or cardiac muscle tissue. So those are the three types of muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle tissue is only found in the heart. Smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of hollow organs, such as the entire gastrointestinal tract and the urinary tract, as well as blood vessels. Skeletal muscle tissue is found in the skeletal muscles of the body, which are under uh, voluntary or subject, rather, to voluntary control. Uh, there are two things that I would like to mention. One is that the term muscle can refer to tissue as well as an organ. So you can talk about skeletal muscle tissue or a skeletal muscle organ, such as the biceps brachii. For the remainder of our discussion of muscles, we are going to focus on skeletal muscles because skeletal muscles are the only muscles that are part of the muscular system. The muscular system does not include cardiac muscle and also does not include smooth muscles. And the muscular system is the focus of our discussion on muscles. Let's now consider the gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle, the organ. So a skeletal muscle is a collection of muscle fibers, skeletal muscle cells, wrapped in various layers of connective tissue. And we're going to use this figure from your book to illustrate the anatomy, gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle. So here we have individual skeletal muscle fibers. These are the individual skeletal muscle cells. Each skeletal muscle fiber is surrounded by a connective tissue layer called an endomycium. About a hundred of these skeletal muscle fibers with their surrounding endomycia are packaged together and surrounded by a perimycium, a second layer of connective tissue. This bundle of skeletal muscle fibers surrounded by a perimycium is called a fascicle. And several fascicles are bundled together and surrounded by a substantial connective tissue layer called an epimycium. And that epimycium forms a cord-like structure called a tendon, which attaches the skeletal muscle to a bone. Now, if you think about the gross anatomy of the skeletal muscle, it should remind you of the gross anatomy of a nerve. Remember that with a nerve, you had individual axons surrounded by various layers of connective tissue. Instead of an endomycium, you had a neuromycium. Instead of a paramycium, you had a perineurium. Instead of an epimycium, you had an epineurium. But the basic anatomy and nomenclature, naming of those connective tissue layers, was the same. In certain parts of the body, the epimycium forms flat sheets of connective tissue that attach muscles to bones rather than cords. And we call these structures aponeuroses. They have the same function and they are made of the same material as tendons. They are simply flat sheets rather than cords. Before ending our discussion, I just want to note that skeletal muscles attach to more than just bones. They attach to cartilages and they also attach to other connective tissue coverings. For example, many of the muscles that are involved in facial expressions have one attachment to a bone and a second attachment to connective tissues under the skin that provide for various movements and production of facial expressions. Now let's review the objectives of this screencast. Describe the functions of muscles. Define extensibility and excitability. Describe the basic anatomy, functions, and locations of the three types of muscle tissue. Describe the gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle. 
And finally, compare and contrast a tendon and an aponeurosis. The next screencast discusses the microscopic anatomy of skeletal muscle fibers.